Um, so this is a patient that uh, we presented last week. Um, and so I'll kind of briefly go through the, the previous history for everyone who was not there. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we did. Uh, so this is a 53 year old uh, female uh, who uh, presented with continued right lower extremity radiculopathy uh, after a revision right L4-5 laminotomy and discectomy that was performed in August of this year. So she had had uh, two previous laminotomies uh, and discectomies at this level. Um, she had also undergone a right L4-5 as well as an L5-S1 transferaminal injection uh, uh, in September uh, of, that should be 2020, uh, with about three to four days of minor relief. The patient uh, was noted to be very active and fit at baseline. Uh, she does have uh, the low back pain and radiculopathy, which is really severely affecting her quality of life. Uh, uh, her examination was essentially uh, normal with the exception of her uh, radiculopathy symptoms. She did have some minor uh, weakness in her gastroxoleus complex as well as her uh, EHL on the right. Uh, this is her uh, plain films. As you can see, she has a uh, significant uh, collapse uh, on her standing films um, uh, at her L4-5 disc space. Uh, it's asymmetric with more collapse on the right side than the left. Um, interestingly, this is her intraoperative films during her last uh, minimally invasive uh, discectomy. This was the localization film. As you can see, she has um, while she's on the table in the prone position, she has a little bit of a uh, spondyl uh, anterior lysis of L4 and L5, uh, which is actually better appreciated on this image than it is on uh, her previous flexion extension films. Um, this is her MRI examination. Uh, you can see L3-4 is pretty much wide open. At L4-5, you can see the uh, previous uh, laminotomy site. Um, on the parasagittal uh, images, you can see that there is maybe some mild uh, uh, continued um, neuroforaminal compression. Uh, however, it's likely uh, dynamic in nature as uh, exhibited by the previous x-rays um, primarily. Uh, L5S1 is, is pretty much wide open. So I'm gonna open this up um, to the audience to uh, make any suggestions about what treatment should be op offered to this patient going forward um, and how it would be best uh, performed. Let's see her pictures again. Of course. So these are her plain films. The uh, PA, the PA film has been flipped. So uh, the right side is on the right side of the screen, just for reference. Yeah, keep going with that. And there's the parasagittal of her L4-5 space. You don't have a coronal MRI, right? Um, hmm. I did have a coronal MRI actually, but I don't think it made it into this presentation. I apologize. Is there is there a sense based on that in the radiograph? She's fairly dynamic vertically as well. That's my sense. Um, she does have some improvement in her pain when she's resting, and you can see in comparison to her standing films, her MRI does not look nearly as collapsed um, on the coronal. I apologize, it's not in this presentation, but you have to trust me on that. It's it's not particularly asymmetrically collapsed. Uh, when uh, she has her supine MRIs. So my sense is that yes, it's pretty much a dynamic process at this point. She's also failed to technically successful uh, minimally invasive uh, decompressions. So again, that kind of points me in the direction of a dynamic instability. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has that synovial cyst as well, which usually occur in the state of some sort of instability. And she looks like she's rotated as well. Mm -hmm. So and I can see even on there, she's rotated at four or five. Mm -hmm. 
So she has a rotational deformity a little bit. She has a little lateral ascesis. Um, uh, she has clearly some dynamic instability based on her clinical examination, her uh, reaction to her previous surgeries, as well as her standing versus supine imaging. So assuming that we all agree on that, what do you think the best next steps would be? He tend to pelvis. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I would go probably T11 to pelvis, Bob, actually. <laughs> All right, so I'm hearing some very aggressive options at this point. I think you could just consider a 4-5 lateral on her, um, plus a lot of stabilization. Okay, so um, I'll move forward from here. So, so I think uh, options here are, are essentially down to fusion based on our interpretation of the instability. I think a lateral is probably going to give her the best um, level of um, correction um, for her deformity and, and probably give her the highest likelihood of a uh, successful outcome. The other, other good option would be an anterior lumbar antibody fusion at four or five. Um, T lift. Why would that uh, be? Why would that be a good option? What, what is that? Explore that a little bit. Sure. If, so, if you've got a four or five problem and and you're considering the that five one is pretty pristine. So I think big, what are you gonna do to future future issues for her at five one? So that's the big downside, and I think that's why a lateral is probably a better option in this case, is that if she does need uh five one um uh worked on in the future, you've kind of created a revision uh problem in the future so exactly um, so that's the problem between before for doing an alif um i think from a technical standpoint an alif would achieve the outcomes um uh desired at this point um and and could be uh performed but i think probably a lateral is a better um option from the standpoint of l5 s1 in the future um other options that could be considered um, that we don't do very often here, but could be considered are a T-lift. I think the likelihood of um, being able to achieve a um, inner body, a correction of the, you know, a height restoration of the inner body space, as well as the um, lordosis that you'd want at that level is gonna be less with a T-lift. Um, it also has a, a smaller um, body um, or smaller footprint. so the likelihood of a successful fusion would be a little bit smaller. So I don't think it's an ideal option, but it's certainly something that could be considered in the right circumstance um, that would potentially help with this problem. Um, so, you know, ultimately we decided on a lateral inner body fusion as everyone here has suggested uh, with posterior pedicle screw uh, instrumentation in the uh, single position. So um, we've chosen that. I think Morning. I think the, the, the things I wanted to bring up to the group were once we've chosen a lateral, um, there's still other, other, uh, you know, other things to decide about. So whether to do a left or right sided approach, whether to do unilateral bilateral pedicle screw instrumentation, or whether to do a single position uh, or flip uh, to do the pedicle screws. So um, in this particular patient, I think given the um, orientation of the disc space here, a uh, right-sided approach is, is going to be more straightforward uh, in terms of avoiding the uh, pelvic brim um, and, and more and easier to do here. Um, both sides are, are reasonable from an MRI anatomy standpoint, um, right or left side. Uh, the big issue from the right side obviously is the vein and that's something that to be, to be cognizant of during the surgery, but certainly doesn't um, con make it contraindicated. Um, and then I was going to talk about some of the literature for single position and flip and unilateral or bilateral pedicle screw instrumentation. So this is ultimately our result, which we were pretty happy with. Again, we did a single position uh, unilateral pedicle screw fixation uh, uh, construct for this. So this is a, uh, a paper on the biomechanical stability uh, for unilateral versus bilateral pedicle screw fixation on lateral inner bodies. Uh, 
It's out of Barrow. The authors used three, 13 cadaver specimens uh, and evaluated the mean range of motion uh, of the lumbar spine following um, fusion uh, in, in these cadaver models with regards to flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. They compared uh, five different configurations compared to an intact spine, uh, in, a, an isolated inner body, inner body plus uni, um, uh, unilateral pedicle screws, inner body plus bilateral pedicle screws, and then uh, unilateral and bilateral pedicle screws alone. Uh, the one, the area that we obviously care about here is the inner body versus uh, the inner body with unilateral versus inner body with lateral pedicle screws. So they noted that the inner body, uh, lateral inner body plus the unilateral pedicle screws significantly reduced the range of motion compared to uh, lateral inner body um, alone in terms of flexion, extension, and lateral bending, but not, in ax but not as much in axial rotation. Uh, the lateral inner body plus bilateral pedicle screws significantly reduced the range of motion in all planes uh, compared to lateral inner body alone, including axial rotation. So there was a little bit of a difference there. Um, however, when there was a direct comparison of lateral inner body with unilateral pedicle screws versus lateral inner body with bilateral pedicle screws, um, there was no uh, difference. There was some non-significant trends toward increasing stiffness with the bilateral pedicle screws. However, again, it was, it was non-significant uh, in this study. This is the uh, image basically showing what I just talked about. So the uh, bars that are that are squared are the bilateral versus uh, unilateral pedicle screws uh, in conjunction with the lateral inner body fusion. The striped bar is the uh, bilateral pedicle screw and the gray bar that's filled in is the, I'm sorry, the striped bar is the unilateral pedicle screws and the gray bar is the bilateral pedicle screws. As you can see, there's a slight trend toward um, uh, in less range of motion in the uh, gray bar as it, it's smaller than the striped bar. And that's showing that basically there's a slight trend toward the bilateral pedicle screw um, construct being a little bit more um, in all planes of motion, which is expected. Again, it was non-significant. So this is in theory um, supposed to uh, give us a sense that the stability uh, profile is relatively similar between uh, these two constructs. This is um, a study that came out about a year later uh, that's basically looking at unilateral versus bilateral perk uh, screw fixation. Um, it was a retrospective comparison of uh, 74 patients undergoing OLIPS by a single uh, surgeon. Um, of note, the bilateral pedicle screws in all of these patients uh, were flipped and the unilateral were all single position. The authors showed uh, a shorter operative time with the unilateral pedicle screws, uh, uh, pretty significant, 76 or 127 minutes. Uh, this was likely secondary to the lack of a flip in this group. Uh, they found a lower cost in terms of unilateral pedicle screws. Otherwise, there was um, uh, no difference in blood loss or hospital stay. VAS and ODI scores, they measured at seven days, and they were a little lower in the unilateral group. But after that, there was no differences. Fusions were relatively similar between the two groups, uh, no significant differences. This is another study that looked at single position versus lateral, then prone positioning or dual position surgery for uh, uh, pedicle screw fixation following yeah. antibody fusion. Uh, they looked at 40, this is out of Stanford. Uh, the authors looked at 42 single position and uh, 24 uh, dual position laterals uh, by a single surgeon in this group. This uh, group actually did statistical adjustments uh, for the number of levels fused, as well as whether they used unilateral, unilateral or bilateral pedicle screws. Uh, and they found that the only really differences uh, between the two groups um, in terms of outcomes were longer OR time in the dual position group. Uh, and this was independent of whether or not they did unilateral or bilateral pedicle screws. There was no other differences uh, overall in terms of um, radiographic outcomes. Um, you can see uh, that when they did their multivariable analysis, um, going from single position to dual position uh, independently added about 44 minutes of OR time. Um, and going from unilateral uh, to bilateral fixation independently, regardless of dual position or single position, added about 26 minutes of OR time on average. So uh, the, the 
the kind of conclusion from these studies that that I, I'm seeing is that essentially unilateral screw fixation for the m most part um, is is uh, adequate uh, for these patients. It definitely decreases um, oh, operative time. It probably increases decreases blood loss by a minimal amount, um, and it's it's certainly an option. <laughs> There, there is a trend to so, less stiffness. Oh, and so Dan, we're concerned about probably uh, dual should be considered. When, when, when you say adequate for these patients, which patients are we speaking of? Um, the studies. What, what diagnoses? What conditions are okay to use unilateral fixation in? Um, Did so, they give a breakdown on the level of instability or what the pathology was? Uh, not that I. Saw, um, not they didn't. So, break. It's a rhetorical question because they don't. They haven't. That's yeah. the problem that we face, right? That, that there really is a biomechanical difference. Uh, we don't know if it's a, if it's a clinically meaningful difference, and then the question is, under what circumstances can you get away with it? Is it is it any spondy? Is it unstable? Is it is it uh, you know relatively stable torsional circumstances? We don't really know the answer to that on a clinical basis, because nobody's really stratified their clinical uh, studies in that way. Um, but I, I think we know enough from the biomechanical studies to suggest that there is a difference. We just don't know if, there's, if, if it translates into a clinically meaningful difference, or we have to be a little apprehensive with the more unstable scenarios, right? And yeah. the, the, there's a yeah. difference in, in axial rotation in mm -hmm. particular, and, and that's that's where I think you get greater concern with the spondies that are unstable because the torsional the torsional uh, instability is, is real. And I don't know that we really have a good handle on how much we need to constrain that to be successful. And, and that's where you really have to kind of stratify patients, I think, to get meaning there. You know, take those patients that you just saw, those relatively small numbered, uh, probably underpowered studies, and, Look specifically mm -hmm. at patients with unstable spondies, and then figure out whether whether you can get away with it with larger numbers and pieces of power. I think yeah. Bob's point is well taken because there's a big difference between a, a degenerative um, spondylolisthesis and somebody who has a dynamic instability. So you really have to be certain of what you're comparing to make statements like that. One other, yeah. point, one other point I think we need to also consider, and I'd like to get everybody's opinion, is uh, this biomechanical studies was really great and first one that was done, but usually these studies uh, show the immediate stability of the spine and sometimes doesn't address the time and what yeah. happens to that uh, metal bone interface over time and loosenings and things that, you know, happens, uh, you know, comparing the unilateral versus bilateral. And I, I don't know uh, the, the follow-up of those clinical pa uh, papers, how, how long was it? And the said fusion was there, but how long it followed? But sometimes that's also the time is a very important point. That's a very good point, Dr. A. Uh, that's a really good point. The, the other thing is um, ultimately the biomechanical studies are not really measuring direct stability of the construct. You know, they're not measuring in terms of how many of these constructs fail. They're measuring in terms of uh, decreased range of motion uh, in a cadaver model with no healing. So there's definitely, you know, obviously it's the best we have, but there's, there's definitely a, quite a bit of a leap between that and an actual clinical application. In this patient, I mean, she's young, she's got pretty good bone. And then in my mind, the fact that I don't need to use the screws to promote any of the reduction is kind of an important factor as well. And it's more about stabilization than reduction. Yeah, we had um, discussed both unilateral and bilateral fixation options for this case. And we we're prepared for both and draped out for both. Ultimately, we had a large footprint with the um, implant and felt that it was 
fairly stable in terms of um, a reduction uh, at the end of that implant. And that's ultimately kind of what made us decide to do the unilateral. Um, again, that's not, that's not really evidence-based, but it's kind of a feel thing and part of the art of medicine. Um, but I think that's, that's one thing that we, we talked about in the, in the case. While we're beating the dead horse, I would say the other thing to remember is uh, bone quality as well. So, you know, taking care of a 40 year old with recurrent disc herniation versus a 80 year old with a degenerative spondy are going to be two different. Uh, so, uh, yeah. uh, different, you know, different components to stability. So just keep that in mind as well as you're uh, work, working through that and, Hanny just mentioned something important too, is sometimes you put in one of these lateral implants and it looks like it fills up the whole disc space. And sometimes you put them in and it looks like, you know, it, it's dwarfed by the size of the bone. So, um, you know, stability, I'm sure in an implant that's got near circumferential contact with the end plate is going to be a little bit different than one that doesn't. So, so all these little factors, I think that, you know, these studies, that you presented, Dan, which I thought was super helpful, do kind of show which way things are pointing. You know, it's like the 36,000 foot view. Should we keep investigating it or not? You know, is this worthwhile, you know, to consider? I think the answer is yes. I think understanding the circumstances around that yes, I think are yet to be determined. I do think the, you know, studies like that are important because they kind of help us say, should we keep chasing this down or not? And, uh, you know, because there's some positive elements to this, right? I mean, just even simply the cost of implants and OR is very beneficial to the health system, right? Because they're going to get the same amount of um, reimbursement. Um, but if we can save money on that, well, that makes spine surgery, um, you know, less costly. Um, faster to hit those metrics that we look at to see if, you know, there's a cost effectiveness of what we do. So, you know, I think uh, having an open mind for that purpose is also a good, a good thing. Hey, Greg, one of, one of the things I've long thought is, you know, we, we measure the stiffness of our construct here in these studies. You know, we're measuring the stiffness of our construct, right? But, you know, the, the, probably the better thing to do would be to measure the, the force transition to the level above and below with these different constructs, too. You know, what are we doing to the levels that aren't being treated surgically? with the various constructs, because, you know, we all see the adjacent segment problems. And I've long argued that the idea that, you know, we're, what we do to the one level, you know, will have a negative impact on the others. Um, yeah, I don't, we, I don't, we had, there's studies out there that look at that biomechanically, but I'm not sure how well they translate to this type of thing. Mean like would unilateral fixation potentially inform that or affect that in some, in some capacity? Well, if you, yeah, so theoretically, hand if you reduce the stiffness of this construct, still still create an environment where it will heal well, but you reduce the force transition to the level above or below, you've done your your patient a favor because now they're they're less physiologically impacted for the levels you don't want to have to treat long term, right? Right. Hey, the other the other quick question handing on this lady, did she go home yesterday? No, she's still here. She's still here. Yeah, still. still she, she's you know, she's just kind of an anxious person, but she's doing great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the steroid helped. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.